Well, when I was drafted, but at the time I wanted to go in, you could no longer volunteer. You, you could, but you had to go to the draft board and say, draft me. And they looked at you real funny. You want to be drafted? And, but they did. They drafted you. That way the record of you coming into service was there forever. There was a section in the commercial appeal. It was a sepia, a brown. And uh, Major Al Williams, uh, Marine Corps, Building Reich Air Power. And I read it like you read a book. And uh, every Sunday it, it, it came out. And there was always something about the war in Europe. And of course, we, most of us come from England, and uh, uh, we saw how they were struggling with the uh, Germans bombing the cities and destroying the people, the schools, the churches, everything. But when you walk through London and you see buildings just as far as the eye can see crumpled and people killed, and it was a terrible time for the English people. And they didn't really like the GIs when they first came over because Americans are sort of arrogant. Um, and uh, they soon learned, though, that we were just young kids and uh, away from home, many of them for the first time in their lives. I doubt if World War II hadn't come along if many of us would have gone more than 50 miles away from home our entire lifetime. I was really young. I was only 18 when I went in, and I didn't get in until I reported for duty January 1, 1944, and uh, I almost didn't get in that war. And they uh, put us in the aviation cadet program, and then we fall out for roll call one morning at Miami Beach and basic training, and he said, got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is the cadet program is over. We've got five pilots for every seat. The good news is you're going to gunnery school. <clears throat> and that didn't sit too well because the saying going around, a gunner today and a goner tomorrow. And uh, But we did go to gunnery school, and at least we were flying. And, uh, They did a good job. Every man on a crew had two jobs. I was a ball turret gunner that's down underneath, and uh, I was also a, an assistant flight engineer. If something happened to the engineer, I could crank the gear down, the bomb bay doors open, retract the gears, change uh, fuses, and transfer fuel. You know, when you go on oxygen at 10,000 feet, <clears throat> you can go higher, but that was the rule because at 30,000 feet, if you lose your oxygen, in five minutes you're unconscious, in 15 minutes you're dead. And he, Johnny used to say, now, when I give this oxygen check, and he would start at the tail, tail gunner, okay, go right on up through the aircraft. He says, if you, I call and you don't answer and I have to come by and check on you, you better be dead or you're going to wish you were. <laughs> and it was a serious thing. We lost two radio operators in our squadron in two missions. They were throwing out this metalized chaff, we called it, deflected the radar signal, and their oxygen came undone, and they passed out and died. And altitude, extreme cold, 50 below zero, 59 below zero. If you touch a piece of metal up there with your bare skin, you become part of it. And the only way you can come out is to take it off your fingers or your hand. I had to wear silk gloves. So if I worked on my guns and I had touched them, I wouldn't freeze to them. And it was, but, the ball turret takes a lot of bad publicity. Uh, the only thing I saw wrong with it was that if you had to get out in a hurry, you might have a problem. But it's the only place you could fight a war and lay on your back at the same time. And uh, uh, it was comfortable. I felt sorry for the tail gunner. He sat back in that tail for about eight hours on a bicycle seat on his knees. To me, that would have been pure torture. But. Uh, Missions become like you people come to work every morning, eight to five or whatever. Uh, you don't think about missions. You just you know that the CQ charge of quarters comes in the next morning and shakes you awake. You're going. Uh, we could always tell, hey Sweeney, what's the fuel load? Twenty two hundred gallons. Oh boy, quick one. We'll be in and out. If he said twenty seven million topped off after pre flight, oh Lord, we're gonna be there all day long. And we didn't know in those days what the jet stream was. You could go in in four hours. It'd take you six and a half to come out because you'd turn and face that 100-mile-an-hour jet stream coming back. And you see a German town, an hour later, you look down, it's still right there. And it seemed like you were never making any progress. Um, 
the equipment we had, P-40s, T-model Fords, the Germans were flying Mercedes by comparison, but the military and the industrial complex did a fantastic job. I had a colonel tell me that in March of 1945, this nation turned out 5,000 aircraft in one day. I mean one month, the month of March. Now that's a lot of airplanes. And on August 17, 1942, the 8th Air Force flew its first altitude mission. A massive flight, 12 airplanes, that's all we had. Nobody knew what they were doing, believe me, they didn't. Now the Air Force record says General Ira Aker led it. Well, I just learned later on that if a general is on an officer, on a mission, and he's flying tail end Charlie, he said to lead it. <laughs> but the leader man in the lead aircraft that day was a young major named Paul Tibbet, who went on to fly the Enola Gay and drop the world's first atomic bomb. And uh, we went on from there with practically nothing to Christmas Eve of 44. My group led the largest mission ever put up by the 8th Air Force, or any other Air Force. 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters. And to get the significance of that, if you took the Russian, the German, the British, the French, and our Air Force today, I seriously doubt if they could put 3,000 combat aircraft in the air at the same time on the same day. And that's why Roger Freeman, the greatest 8th Air Force historian, labeled the 8th Air Force the Mighty 8th, because they were mighty indeed. Maybe it'll get somewhere in the records. I have seen the Air Force's um, rendering of that mission. They say General Fred Castle, who came over that day to our group, and was in the lead ship. He was killed. And they said he had a mechanical problem and he aborted the mission and he was jumped by German fighters. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because if I'd have had the proverbial 10-foot pole, I could have reached out and touched his airplane. I was right off his left wing when he went down. And he had engine trouble all right. When you get an engine a cell full of 20 millimeter German shells, you got a problem. That was the worst mission my group ever flew as far as losses. We lost 13 ships in 13 minutes. It's the only mission I ever flew that I thought, well, you'll be dead in just a few minutes. And I remember thinking, well, what was it going to do? Hurt 10 seconds, 30 seconds, and then you'll be dead. And then there was no panic. There was no fear. I really got mad. I said, well, if I'm going, I'm going to take as many of you guys with me as I can. And I really got cranked up. And there's one less FW-190 in this world today because I did shoot him down. Our low squadron lost. We had 13 ships in a squadron. They lost 11. We lost General Castle, our lead, and tail end Charlie. And uh, it, it was a pretty sad day, believe me. Uh, you get back to the base and you see all the empty bunks. and uh, You just worn out completely. I tell you, the first mission I ever flew, I saw my first B-17 blow up. He was on fire. They told him to bail out, and he was pulling away from the formation and just <clears throat> a ball of fire, molten metal just across the sky. Nobody got out. And I thought, then, you know, I could get hurt doing this. But you soon get into a state of, it's another day, it's another mission. And the sooner I fly them, the sooner I'm going home. Uh, the worst mission for me was 30th of November of 44. The Germans were protective of their oil fields. Merseburg, Magdeburg, and Leipzig flak areas overlap. So it made no difference which way you went in to Merseburg, which way you came out, you were going to catch hell. And they say up to 4,000 guns. The 8th Air Force lost 56 bombers and 30 fighters in one day, almost 600 men. And uh, it was the biggest flak battle of the war. And I told old Colonel, I said, hey, I'll go to Berlin four more times. You promise me I don't ever have to go back to Merseburg. <laughs> I didn't like that place. I went there twice, but I didn't want to go again. And then on our 27th mission was Dresden, Germany. Uh, we 
If you get off course, you've got flat corridors. If you stay on course and stay in the corridors, they can shoot at you, but they can't hit you, for the theory, anyway. But we got off course to the right. There was only about eight bursts of flak, and we caught every one of them. But nothing happened, or at least nothing we could tell. And then we turned on the IP and started the bomb run. We lost number one. And then right after the bombs away, we lost another one. <clears throat> so we turned and went into Poland. And uh, I've been to Maxwell Field. I've read the report. A guy in the high squadron reported us uh, losing altitude but under control. And we let down in a snowstorm that you literally look out the window and you couldn't see your wingtips. And the pilot says, what do you want to do, boys, bail out or ride it down? I said, wait a minute, can you control this thing? He said, yeah. I said, let's ride it down. I said, if we bailed out and the chute would be so fortunate as to open, we'd be a block of ice when we hit the ground and nobody would know where we were, least of all us. So we bellied it in on a cabbage patch and, and the Russian Air Force picked us up and... Uh, we stayed there about 10 days with the Russians at Warsaw. But the next day we went out to get our bags out of the plane and the Russians said, Nick, well our bomber did. His father was Russian, his mother was Polish. Johnny spoke all three. And they wouldn't let us go get our bags. And we said, what's the matter? And Johnny says, he just told me we've landed in a German minefield. And I stood there and watched them blow up mines all the way around that airplane. Then the old Air Transport Command came in and picked us up and flew us into Poltava, which was an American base in Russia. And on the 21st of April, which is still coming up this month, it would be 62 years ago, I flew my last mission. And uh, on the 25th of April, of uh, 45, the 8th Air Force flew its last mission of the war. I didn't know it at the time. I went in and told Captain Moser. I said, uh, Captain, I think today's my last one. He said, just a minute, Sergeant. He came and he said, yeah, you're done. I said, you meet me over at the NCO Club tonight, I'll buy you the biggest beer in all of England. And uh, well, what I didn't know was the last mission the group ever flew. They were brief, they taxied out, they'd be ready to take off in a red flare, mission scrub. Patton's 3rd Army would overrun the target before they could ever get off the ground. So after that, uh, most of the time they dropped food to the poor people in Europe who had nothing to eat, nothing to wear. We came home and nobody even talked about the war. It was something that we did. And when I was discharged, I was just 19 years old. And uh, no, I had just turned 20 the week before. And when you're that young, that kind of stuff doesn't really live with you. Now I knew I ran into some, I ran into them every now and then. They will not talk about anything. Uh, I don't know what happened to them, and they won't tell me. Uh, but uh, air war is different. Sure, I saw on my first mission an airplane blow up that I knew 10 men perished in. But I didn't see them. I saw a piece of metal disintegrate and fall apart. You don't, it's not like trench warfare where you look down and see your buddy laying on his back or on his face and blood coming out of him. Uh, we had nobody on our crew wounded. Uh, it's just... Uh, well, you, you get married, you got children, you got to educate them, and you get more things on your mind than what happened in 1945. And uh, then in, in your old age, you get to thinking about it. Hey, here I am, still kicking. Then in 1983, we met here in Atlanta and formed the Georgia chapter of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. Um, and we've been very active in. Uh, that's all the groups, no matter what kind of group. It was a base air depot. Those people rebuilt them when we tore them up. And uh, bomb groups, fighter groups. Uh, uh, we were in Savannah in February, one, two, three, where we celebrated the 65th anniversary of the founding of the 8th Air Force. It was founded in Savannah, Georgia, January 28, 1942, in an old National Guard armory was activated there. It's now America Legion Post 135. And we had people from all over the country. Uh, I've got a niece that's in the insurance business. She owns her own agency. And she said that she visited with me one time. She said, you know, Uncle Henry, our insurance actuary tables tell us that men born when you were born, average age was 57. I said, well, we kind of blew that one, didn't we? And uh, 
Uh, I've got a good friend of mine here. He's 86. General Lou Lyle is 91. Um, but they're going. Uh, we celebrated the 60th anniversary in Savannah. And uh, Gabby Gabreski was the top U.S. fighter pilot in Europe. He had 32 Germans. And I called him. He said, Henry, I'm not going to make it. I haven't felt good since September. Well, we had our celebration on the Monday, the 28th of January. He died on Thursday. And uh, Bob Johnson was the number two. He went home for Christmas, had a little problem, went in the hospital. The nurse came out of the room and said the colonel's made his last flight. But they're getting old. They're, what, 1,200 a day? Eighth Air Force veterans? Uh, not Eighth Air Force, World War II veterans. And uh, I led, well, I just talked to a lady last Sunday. She called me from California. And, I found out two more of our group are gone, and uh, it's just for those of us who are still going are going to keep on keeping on. That's all you can do. If you ever let up, you're gone. Keep the throttle against the stops. 